All right, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, welcome back to yet another episode of Pop Culture Junkies. Today I want to talk to you about a bit of comics history inspired by a local trip to a local convention. I want to talk to you about the JLA Avengers crossover. Let's go. All right, everyone, thanks for tuning in for another episode of Pop Culture Junkies. So recently, I was at the All Seas Comic Expo here in Denver, Colorado. It's a small comic show put on by a local comic book shop. They do it actually in the spring and the fall every year. There's maybe like 20 vendors there. Uh, you see a lot of local artists. It's a cool little trip. It's like five bucks. But what I did run into at one booth, there was a pack of JLA Avengers. It was like the full set for 60 bucks. Side note, I should have bought it. I thought it was overpriced when I got home and checked eBay. The cheapest ones were like 80. So kicking myself for that one. But it did make me think of the history of this book. And so a lot of people don't know the history of this book. And so I thought I would go over it a little bit. A lot of this information's out on the web. You can certainly Google it. I know a lot of people don't want to Google it all and read it. And so that's why I'm going to give it to you here today. So this book came out in 2003. People had been waiting decades for the JLA Avengers crossover. And that when it came out in 2003, it was amazing. It was penciled by George Perez, the, the master. No one else could possibly have been brought in to do that book. Maybe Jim Lee, but who, who knows when it would have been finished at that point. And so you can currently get the four issues, like I said, for under 100 bucks right now on eBay all day. There's some cheaper deals to be had out there, so keep your eye out. I would definitely suggest picking it up, particularly with, unfortunately, George passing. There's not going to be a whole lot of reissues of this book or other copies. It was hard enough for them to come out this year in 2022, right? 20 years later, it was, it was extremely difficult for these companies to come together and put out a book in memory of George, right, for this huge event to remember this monumental artist and these two companies could barely get together to agree to put this book out. And to be frank, this book like prints money, right? You put JLA and Avengers together, it's printing money and they still cannot do it. So the real story of this book took decades, right? I remember, I remember in 2003 when it came out, it was monumental. What I didn't remember really realize was all the decades before that, how much back and forth there was about this book. And so let's talk about it for a little bit. Spider-Man and Superman first crossed over in 1976. Hulk and Superman crossed over in 1981. Batman and Hulk teamed up in 1981. X-Men and Teen Titans was published in 1982, right? So starting in 76, you start to have this huge uptick in these company crossovers. At the same time in 1982, right about the time uh, X-Men and Teen Titans was coming out, maybe a little bit before, the, the ink was dry on the contract to do the Justice League JLA Avengers crossover. Part of the stipulations in the contract included that each company could have one editor assigned to the project, DC would do the editorial production, and Marvel would handle the marketing and distribution. As you would expect, the contract also allowed each company to make modifications to the story to make sure they felt like their characters would be using correctly, etc. Everything had to be mutually acceptable for this book to get published. This is a key point here, right? These two companies had to get along on every point of the story for it to happen. So some key players and the main players here, Len Wein, who was the editor for Justice League in 1982, Jim Shooter was the editor-in-chief for Marvel in 1982. Mark Grunewald was the Avengers editor in 1982. And Dick Giordano was a VP at DC and one of their editors as well. And so initially the creative team assigned to the book was Jerry Conway, who had done both Avengers and JLA in the past. And Roy Thomas would provide the actual script. And then George Perez would do the pencils. In case you don't know, a lot of times comic books, they aren't written panel for panel, every little detail that happens, particularly in the 70s. There was what's called, initially, it was called the Marvel style, where you would just give plot points to an artist and they would draw the book. And then the writer would come in and fill in actual dialogue that matched the plot. That's why you have someone who's doing a plot and that's why you have someone who's doing a script. The idea was Jerry Connor would do this plot, give the plot to George Perez, he would draw it, and then Roy Thomas would come in and do the actual script on the book afterward. Perez is the only person possible who could do this book at the time. He was the biggest artist in comics. Biggest, 
biggest, one of the first megastar artists in comics, had drawn both the, the Justice League and Avengers, was the, if any book ha could pick any artist to do it, every book would have picked George Perez at the time. In 1982, mid-1982, there's the first public report that this project is potentially happened. It came up in Comic Reader, a magazine called Comic Reader, number 203. A few days after this announcement that there's going to be a JLA X-Men project, that's when the Teen Titans X-Men crossover comes out. By fall 1982, it's announced that annually they're going to have an X-Men Teen Titans crossover, right? Printed all this money, collected all this money, and now they're like, holy shit, we should do this all the time. 1983 was the planned meeting for Justice League and Avengers when everyone was told that you this book will be out next year. And so then the first signs of trouble started showing up almost immediately after it was announced. Jim Shooter's wondering where the plot is. He wants to see the plot to approve it before the book's ever put out. With a project this large, with this many people with their hands in it, we're talking fall of 1982, if you don't have a plot by that point for someone to then approve it, the multiple steps of approval, for then the artist to draw it, for then the actual story to be done, right? Remember, plot, art, script, all of those steps of approval get done each and every time. It's really unlikely that this book is going to come out in 1983 on time. Like this, this requires a lot of work from a lot of people to make that happen, and there's probably just not time at this point when the plot finally comes in february 1983 right they told them in fall it was coming it doesn't show up till february of 1983 it's rejected by everyone at marvel everyone at marvel reads this plot and deems that it's unacceptable they they ship it back start over again dc please most people who read it feel like it had a lot of people doing things and making decisions that were just there to get to the next page versus making sense for the actual characters. What was their motivation? Why would they ever do this? Tom Brevoort, I think that's how you say his last name. He actually has a, a published a, a version of this original script if you want to read it. I'll put the link down below and you can go check it out. I don't think it was a great story. I think it's probably wise that they rejected it. Shooter, Perez, multiple others don't like this plot. Again, has people making decisions that make no sense. Their characters are just existing to move the story along, not for any other reason. Um, there's even the potential that the submitted plot was technically the second version, and the first before that was so bad that DC wouldn't even send it to Marvel. Later on, there was a conference call, Jim Shooter, Mark Grunewald, Len Wein. They brainstormed some ideas to fix some of the problems in the story. And when DC asked if they could start having Perez start working on the pencils, Shooter immediately shot them down and said, absolutely not, do not do that. He wanted to see a written plot before any work began on the pencils. Uh, Len Wein didn't anticipate this answer before the call. He had already sent uh, the plot over to Perez to start doing the pencils. As you can expect, this didn't lead to a great outcome. We're mid-1983. Jim Shooter finds out that DC had George Press start the pencils, right? He's out at Comic-Con, right, of, of all places, and uh, Chris Claremont shows up at the, the Marvel booth or whatever, and is like, hey guys, I saw the pencils for JLA Avengers, it looks great, and like record scratch, everyone's like, what the fuck? And so at that point, Jim probably loses his shit all the way. Everyone knew that it was against the contract until both publishers sign off on this plot and the script for any work to be started on the pencils. So George is actually on page 21, right? He's been working on this for two weeks. He's already got 21 pages done. He gets a call to stop work, regroup with Marvel and DC on an approved story. Jerry Conway is asked to revise the plot once again, right? Potentially a third time, but officially a second time. He refuses and just says, I'm off. I'm done. Done with this project. Leave me alone. Uh, so DC has an employee. His name is Joey Cavallari. They have him put together a new plot. Shooter rejects it again. Not good enough. Reportedly doesn't make any sense. Essentially, it's the same exact plot and no other actual specifics for the rejection are given or noted anywhere. So Dick Giordano, the VP and executive editor at DC, he emails, uh, emails, email didn't even exist then. He mails Jim Shooter a letter, right? Physical letter, kid with stamps and mails it from his office in New York City across town to Jim Shooter's office. And Giordano takes responsibility for having press start penciling, right? It's our fault. We shouldn't have done that, guys. 
but can you just please send us your changes, Jim Shooter, so that we can get this project going? Uh, even if we have to start over from scratch, we may have to get a new creative team, right? This is Giordano's message to Jim Shooter, but I need to know what you want to do with changes or, or we're going to start all over again. If so, we're going to have to find a whole new team at this point. Shooter fires back, he doubles down like, hey man, I, you, I need to approve the plot and you guys haven't sent me one worth approving. That's your fault. You send me a plot I can approve and we can move forward. And then Shooter actually does send a second letter with specific concerns in the plot. So he does acquiesce. He does say, all right, Giordano, you want to know what my problems are with this plot? Here they are, point by point. So Giordano sends these concerns, all the other versions of the plot that they've gotten so far, and the penciled pages over to Roy Thomas. Roy and Giordano start working on uh, how to address these plot issues over the phone. Giordano takes Shooter out to lunch that summer and begs him like, just let this book be published. Who cares? We It'll sell like crazy no matter what. We'll both take credit for this massively successful project. Who cares like what the quality of this is? Shooter's like, I fucking care what the quality of this is. I'm putting my name on it. I, I'm gonna be part of this monumental thing and I want it to be good. And so he insists again on, you need to revise the plot and send it back. And so summer 1983, Roy Thomas turns in a completed plot. Remember this was fall 1982. They said this book would be out in 1983. Now we're all the way to summer. The story hasn't even been approved yet. So Roy Thomas turns in a completed plot. It's given to Jim Shooter in July. I believe it was, the rumor is it was hand delivered to Shooter in person. There's some debate about that later on between the two parties, Jim saying maybe it was a hand delivered, DC insisting it was. Again, that's like 50 years ago at this point, and I don't think we'll ever know the truth on that part, guys. Both companies right at this time, this is July of 83, so they're getting ready for Comic-Con, uh, San Diego Comic-Con, which typically happens in that July, August period every year, right? And this was when Comic-Con was huge, right? This was the glory years of Comic-Con. So both companies are ramping up for it. Giordano, Marvel doesn't respond to him sending over the script. Giordano's not that concerned because he's like, well, they're getting ready for Comic-Con. We're getting ready for Comic-Con. We'll hear from them, you know, afterward or whatever. Tom DeFalco, uh, another editor, writer who reviewed Roy Thomas's version, actually felt like it was an amazing version. He felt like it incorporated all the art that George Perez had done well and addressed all of Marvel's concerns perfectly. So Giordano says he and Shooter, they run into each other at Comic-Con, right? Giordano asks if Shooter has read the plot. Shooter says, I haven't had time to. I'll try to get to it sometime this weekend. So Giordano's like, yeah, that'd be great. The whole creative team's here. So if there's issues, we could hash it out, iron out the kinks. And by the time the con's over, we can just get straight to work. Shooter has a different version of that weekend. <laughs> um, he says Giordano handed him the plot at that point, right? This is where that whole hand delivery thing days earlier gets a little twisted. But again, if Giordano didn't hand it to him before, why did Shooter say no, but he'll read it that weekend? I don't know. I'm not calling Jim a liar. I'm just saying some like, clearly these two stories don't add up between them. That's, and they're both gonna take it all the way to the end. So he says Giordano handed him the plot when they saw each other at Comic-Con and asked for instant approval. Here's a, here's a copy, Jim. I need you to approve this right now. Shooter refuses. I'm not gonna give you approval right this second. I'll take it back and read it and get back to you guys. Giordano denies that he ever asked for instant approval. He, he says that's something that Jim is making up and that was never a thing. In any case, in August of 1983, after Comic-Con, anyways, in August 1983, after Comic-Con, Jim finally reads the plot. He asks some Marvel staffers for feedback. The Marvel staff feel strongly that DC is not trying to put out a quality book, but to make a quick buck, and Giordano tried repeatedly through August of, of 83 to actually get in touch with Shooter. So Dick Giordano is pissed that it's taken this long. Shooter thinks it's fair. In the Back in the olden days when they did the whole Spider-Man crossover with Superman, right? That was what, 76? It took DC two months to approve the plot. And so to Jim's mind, he's like, look, you guys took two months when you were looking over plot points to see about this book. I've only looked over this version. Again, you've given me the, the third one here. And I'm gonna take my time looking it over. And I don't think a, a few months is unreasonable if that's how long it takes, whatever. So a uh, same month, August of 83, George Perez is in a magazine called Comics Interview. And he announces in that interview, I'm off the project. Like 
I'm, you're the first to know it. You're interviewing me right now and I'm going to tell you I'm leaving the project. He's frustrated with the whole process. He's frustrated with Jim Shooter in particular, and he just removes himself from the project. In September 1983, <laughs> Jim Shooter approved the plot. Perez and others continue to give interviews about how frustrated they are with Shooter and Marvel. Marvel officially announces the project is shelved in Marvel Age number 12. That comes out in November 1983. So now we're over a year since the initial announcement, and now the project's shelved. And now the relationship between the two companies, right? There's no more X-Men Teen Titans because now the whole relationship has soured completely. So JLA Avengers dies a slow death. Just as it's dying, Marvel announces Secret Wars, this huge event penned by none other than Jim Shooter. A lot of people believe this has to do with his submarining the project to begin with. I don't know if he really would have ruined a project that big just to put his own huge project out. I think the timing just unfortunately lined up that way. I'm sure Secret Wars was something they had been working on as big an, as an event as that was. I'm sure it's something they had been working on for some time leading up to it, who knows. In 1985, DC would do their own huge crossover, the Crisis on Infinite Earths, and crossovers within a company just started to become this huge, big thing. And the inner company crossovers just died away completely. And we didn't see them again until way in the 90s. It is interesting, Jim Shooter was removed as our Marvel's editor in 1987. The exact day he was removed George Perez contacted Dick Giordano and said I, hey I still want to do JLA Avengers just FYI it took until 2002 for the companies to get all of their shit together and we finally got the JLA Avengers crossover uh, it was written by Kurt Busiek it was penciled by George Perez again the only person who probably should or could pencil it Kurt's an amazing writer. He did an amazing job on the Avengers reboot with George Perez. And it's a it's a great, great crossover story. It does make sense what the characters do. And so if you see it out there, you should pick it up. But this was really just, I want to see if you guys, I love the history, the lore behind these books that get made. And I thought when I saw those books at the show this weekend, this is a great story to tell to make sure we kind of preserve you know, what went into making these books. Remember, if you like this content, guys, to hit the like, hit the subscribe, and I'll see you on the flip side.